So good to have all of you here and online. Wow, this has been amazing already. I'm thrilled at what the Lord's doing. I can just feel the hearts in the room and the hearts that are spilling over in the chat from all over. It's just powerful. I'm feeling Jesus' heart for us together as we gather. And, you know, for for these last few years, just feeling Jesus' heart for his church. But there's something so powerful with the fellowship of the saints. And so I'm so grateful for that. I'm grateful for you. I want to pray as we begin. I'm going to talk tonight about the jealousy of Jesus for our first love and full glory. And again, I'm feeling the Lord's heart, the Lord Jesus' heart for his church, for you and I. His zeal, his jealousy, his commitment for our first love and for our full glory. So Jesus, here we are. Lord, I'm asking that you would touch our hearts tonight by your spirit. Lord, I'm asking that you would tenderize our hearts, that you would cause us to feel and know and experience your jealous love. Jesus, you are the bridegroom. It's your heart to bring us into the fullness of, of the glorious inheritance, your inheritance that you have in us, that glorious future. You want to bring us into that. You want to cause our hearts to be strengthened tonight, to be tenderized. Lord, I ask for that Holy Spirit impartation. We ask for that tangible presence. God, we thank you for the glorious gift you've given to us in one another. We thank you that you have given us this gift of the fellowship of burning hearts, the international family of affection. God, we thank you. Lord, we ask, meet us. Meet us tonight in your name. Amen. Well, you can open in your Bibles to Revelation 2. I'm going to be speaking primarily about Jesus' words to the church in Ephesus about first love, really I'm speaking about the jealousy of Jesus. And I'm speaking about his commitment and his zeal for his church. So you can open to that, what's on my heart. I believe the body of Christ in our day, Jesus is calling us to return to our first love. It's one of some of the things that Stuart highlighted, that return to me, to your first love. Which is the very opposite of what we've been talking about so much in this last year. It's the very opposite of the lukewarm spirit that we see in Revelation 3 in the church to Laodicea. So these two bookend letters to the churches, we see Jesus' commitment and zeal. We see his heart to bring his church into those qualities of first love and out of Every shade of indifference, of dullness, of disconnect, of self-reliance, all of those, you know, descriptions of the lukewarm spirit. He's so committed to it. And I believe one of the things that strengthens our hearts is when we encounter and see and behold the beauty of that jealous bridegroom heart, our jealous God. He's the all-consuming fire. He never starts a fire and walks away. He finishes what he starts. But he's looking for our voluntary love. He's looking for our voluntary agreement and our partnership. So that he can bring us into that ultimate place that we see at the end of the story. At the end of the story, we see a bride made ready. We see a a bride in unity together. With the Holy Spirit crying, come Lord Jesus. That's our story. That is, you know, Jesus right now is a real man. He's fully God. He's really alive. He's seated upon a real throne. And he has his eyes set like a straight shot to the day of the gladness of his heart. And I think his question to us is, 
Is that where our, our eyes are set? Is that the dream of our heart? Because the more that that becomes our dream, the more we can walk in agreement with him and become that bride that we see that mature, fully in love, fully lovesick, together in unity bride at the end of the age. It's really our future. The biblical story doesn't end with a fainting church. Isn't that amazing? Our story does not end with weariness, dullness, compromise, dividedness, indifference. No. Our story ends with holy, lovesick, passion, wholehearted, unified, together. Jesus, we love you all that you are. There's not a part of you that we say no to. We love who you are. And together with all the saints in that fellowship, loving him, longing for him, crying out in unity with the Holy Spirit, come Lord Jesus. That's our future. That's our story. And I think in in these last years we've been walking through, these last 18 months, however the time frame has been, I feel the disruption of Jesus as that jealous heart is breaking in. And it's it's touching our hearts. You know, we feel the disruption and the Lord's getting our attention. And he's saying, are you ready to have these conversations? I've never changed my mind. This is who I am. This is my story. This is your story. This is the glorious plan and future. Will you come into agreement? Will you join me? That's the the jealous heart of Jesus. He spared nothing to redeem his bride. And he spares nothing to keep us and to mature us in holy love. He refuses to relent. He refuses to relent until we become that glorious, that glorious inheritance, that glorious bride together. He refuses to relent. He's unrelenting. He is the all-consuming fire, that jealousy. It, it, you know, it's, it's that husband's fury that refuses to let any lesser love have place in our hearts, right? But the other thing I love about his jealousy it's the Isaiah 42, 3. This verse always gets me. He's the jealous Jesus that a bruised reed he won't break. A flickering wick he won't quench. His jealousy is so fervent that he will kneel down beside the flickering flame of our love. He will cup his hands around it and he will blow upon it and say, I won't let it go. I will not let it go. I started this flame. I have every intention to bring it to full fire. I won't let it go. So no matter how weak we feel, no matter how disrupted we feel, no matter how confused, there's many, many things that we're all feeling together and individually. We have a God who is unrelenting in jealous love. He'll overcome our enemies, every enemy of love, and he will come up underneath our deficiencies. He'll make a way where we're weak, He'll cup his hands around that flame and blow upon it until it comes to full fire. He's just looking for our yes. That's who he is. He's the jealous God. He refuses lukewarm and indifferent, dull love. He gave all for the gut level, loyal love. And that's the thing about first love. That's the thing I love about this passage. I love that Jesus goes straight to the heart of everything. Let's look, at, let's look at Revelation 2, verse 4. I'm just going to start right with the indictment. <laughs> you know, he says a few good things, and then he says, nevertheless. <laughs> I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you've fallen. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. This is our Jesus. And 
He's inviting us to take this personally. I love the word remember. Remember where you've fallen from. It's as if he's getting right into our face and he's going, I remember. Do you remember? I remember the first love. It's, it's like the heart that we see put on display through the prophet Jeremiah. I remember you, the days of your youth when you ran after me in the wilderness. Like a bride, you ran after me with all your heart. That same heart here we see in Revelation 2. I remember. I remember the way you loved me and went after me with that open-hearted, vulnerable, tender. I believe you. Everything in us believed. And we were tender and we were trusting. Heart wide open. You know, you think of first love. What does first love look like? What does it look like to be in first love? That's what it is. It's vulnerable. It's heart wide open, full trust, wholehearted. I am in. I remember when I first fell in love with Matt Candler. I mean, it was hard and fast. I remember being on the phone with my parents and I needed them to know this was different. <laughs> <laughs> this was the one. And, you know, they're far away. They don't know this, but I actually was standing on the kitchen table to give this announcement. <laughs> this was a big announcement. I met the guy. I remember my sister, Deborah, she starts talking to me like, kind of like, oh, he's cute, you know. And I remember <laughs> I, I practically rebuked her. It was like, this is serious. This is the Lord. This is not cute. Do not call this cute. You know, it was all in. I mean, we were, we were the epitome of first love. Weeping, weeping, weeping. Whenever we were separated, weeping. I mean, weeping. I'm not lying. There were witnesses. <laughs> First love, that I trust him. I trusted him with my life. The irony is I hardly knew him. But I trusted him. I really didn't. I remember when he asked my dad for my hand, which I shouldn't even tell how fast that was. I shouldn't. Maddie, my daughter, close your ears. It was like six weeks <laughs> After we'd met. Um, <laughs> and my dad lived out of town. And it just so happened that he was in town. And this was the time. You know, Matt's dad came to Matt and said, you got to do it. Like, do you want to get on a plane? Do you want to spend the money to do that? Or do you want to do it now? All right, then. I mean, there I am. I'm in the car. I didn't even plan to tell this story. But I'm in the car. I'm with my mom and my brother. And Matt's out there with my dad. And my brother's like, What's he telling mom? I mean, what's he telling dad? What's he saying to dad? What is he saying? You know, what could he be saying? They just met that night. And I remember saying to my brother, I don't know. I hardly know the guy. I don't know what he's capable of. Come to find out he was quite capable. I mean... First love. There are qualities to first love, right? There are qualities. It's, it's full in, full, wholehearted, open-hearted trust. I want to tell you everything. I want to know everything. It's that lovesick, vulnerable. We get it. We know it. And then Jesus says, that's what I want. The whole way. Like, Years, decades, doesn't matter. I want that quality of love from start to finish. I used to love this passage. And I remember several years ago when all of a sudden I didn't love it as much. Because I love the passage because it's Jesus saying, I want your first love. And I love Jesus, how he, he always makes it so central about the first commandment. 
And you know, I, I felt like you, you've got it. I'm in. And then several years ago, I remember when I'm looking at this passage and I'm thinking about first love qualities. What does that mean? And I'm looking at the end of the story. The reason we know that Jesus wants first love all the way through is not only because he says it right here, but because he does it by the end. She, the bride, the church is in first love, right? She's a bride made ready. That's the epitome of first love. She is not old, weary, dull, disheartened. She is full, wholehearted, longing, yearning, loving, vulnerable, trusting, agreeing, right? So I remember a few years ago when I'm staring at this passage, I'm thinking about first love and I feel a gap. There's a gap. And it, it tore my heart. I'm going, Jesus, wait a second. Things started happening I didn't plan on. There were some hard circumstances. There were some twists and turns. There was some, some accusation that seeped in and people were mad or I was disappointed or I failed or I, I, there's so many things. And I don't even know all the whys, but this I know. I have memories and I don't necessarily feel that way anymore. And it broke my heart. And I believe that even though it's difficult, the Lord, he wants us to take his word so seriously that we're willing to put it in front of our, our hearts and our lives and say, show me the gaps because your word is what's true. And if there's a gap between this truth and my experience, close the gap, God. Because any time that the Lord speaks a rebuke, you can turn that right over, flip it. It's a promise. The end of this passage speaks to the over overcomers. There's a promise. He's going, I will give you every grace to keep first love all of your days. Are you in? Are you in? This is what is in my heart. This is my intention. This is the Holy Spirit zeal, the one who lives on the inside of you. He's burning to bring you into this, that the very love with which the father loved me, that it would be in you, that kind of love. And I don't take less. I want it all. I want the fullness. And so he's looking for our agreement and he really will. Do it as we say yes to him. Sometimes what happens, I'm going to highlight a couple things. There's, there's many hindrances to first love. And I just want to say, for some tonight, the Lord wants to begin first love. Begin it. For some, there's those memories that the Lord wants to Restore it. Because the point is, first love is the necessary starting point for the glorious future we're headed into. And so, you know, sometimes we think, okay, Jesus wants me to go back to what I used to be so because what I used to be was the best. No, 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 no. What you used to be was great. <laughs> but that's not the best. That's just necessary to get you where you need to go in the future. And so the Lord wants to ignite first love for, for those of us that, that maybe in our relationship with Jesus haven't necessarily felt those qualities. If, if we were to kind of list and, and write out what our relationship with Jesus looks like, we may not describe it like those qualities of first love. The Lord's saying, I want to show you who I am. I want to cause your heart to burn. I actually want to overcome you with my love so that you will experience and know that first love. And then for others, it's a returning. 
It's a restoring. But all of us together, we have to come to first love in order to get to where he's bringing us. That mature bride, fullness of love, fullness together in unity, wholehearted desire at full capacity. That's what we see at the end of the story. It's desire at full capacity. It's all for Jesus. In other words, our desires aren't filled with a thousand lesser things. It's all for him. We are caught up in longing, in yearning, in lovesickness for only him. That's where he's leading us. And he's so zealous to do it. So I want to highlight two obstacles. Again, there are many. I just want to highlight two. One of the obstacles to first love is unbelief. Unbelief can creep in. And it can creep in without us even opening the door. It can come in. It can seep in in ways we don't even recognize. Sometimes it's through accusation. When we feel accused, we might feel accused by others. We might feel the, the adversary, the the one who's every day and every night seeking to take us out in our heart. He makes his aim straight at the heart, right? We might feel that accusation and slowly and gradually over time draw back from Jesus. Because we, we kind of assume he feels what we're feeling. We put that on him, right? It might be because of delay. Sometimes what we started with, we lose it over time because the delay was so long. But what happens is we back away from confidence. Whether it's confidence before him as his beloved, the one that he loves, the one that he enjoys, the one that he delights in. Or confidence that he will do what he said he would do. We lose confidence. And that can feel neutral to us. It can feel like, well, yeah, doesn't everybody? <laughs> you know? I mean, or we can look at all of our circumstances that we've gone through and feel a bit justified. I remember that's how I felt before the Lord. When, when this passage started to pierce my heart and I saw the gap, I, I'll confess I felt a little bothered towards the Lord. Jesus. You get it, right? I mean, I know. I know. I know that technically, on paper, I may not be responding to you with that first love, full, passion, wholehearted. And, and by the way, I'm not making a big emphasis on emotion. I'm making a big emphasis on a burning center. It doesn't have to look like big emotion. I'm talking about a burning center. And I knew that something had gone wrong in the burning center. I didn't have what I had at first. And I remember feeling that frustration with the Lord over this passage going, Jesus, you know, Lord, you know, you know, I've done everything. I, I've done what you do when you try to keep first love. I had a few like justifications you know, because I had all those meetings, God, you know, how, how you have to have those meetings with those that you get hurt by. Because if you don't do the second commandment, you wake up a few years later and you can't do the first anymore because your heart's shut down. That's real. And so I remember just like, Lord, you know, I, I've been so zealous that my heart would be tender and I don't know how this happened. And it was like the Lord, he came to me. You know, how he speaks to me. And I believe he's, he's speaking to some of us here tonight in the same way. And he's saying, you know, so you grew up and you changed. And you think I have too. But I am already old. <laughs> and the ancient of days. I never change. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I never change. And you think I've changed because you've changed. But let me tell you, you don't actually have a love problem. 
you have a belief problem. You have a faith problem. You don't believe me. In order to have first love all of our days, be vibrant, we have to keep believing Jesus. He is who he says he is. Do we believe he's the bridegroom? Like, do we? It's not, I I don't think it's new anymore. It was new a few decades ago. It was pretty new. But I think in our day, it's not that new. There's lots of songs. It's filling the church. It's not that new to understand the revelation of Jesus as the bridegroom. But do we really believe it? That he's that jealous? That he's that tender? Have we let it become so invasive that it tears our hearts open and wounds us? He's going, do you believe me? I'm actually who I say I am. I'm a bridegroom. You're the bride. I I haven't changed. You know those desires I started in you for me? I started that because I wanted and I intend to bring that to full flame. I want you to believe me. Do you believe that what what I say in, in my word is true? Do you believe the story? Do you believe where I'm leading human history? Do you believe it? Really? Have you read the end of the story? Have you read Revelation? Do you believe it? Church, do you believe it? Will I do it? Are you in? Are you with me? That's the kind of conversations he's wanting to have. Because when our hearts are in first love, we're looking at him eye to eye, face to face, going, help my unbelief, wherever it is, God. I hate it. I don't want to not believe you. So maybe there is some unbelief, but you're so jealous that you'll overcome it. As long as you have my yes, as long as you have my agreement. So he's looking for that conversation. For me, I remember, (laughs) I'm going to tell the story. This is going to be my favorite story of the night. Oh, I forgot. I told the Matt story. That was unexpected. It's another favorite story. So I'm sitting across a table. I think it was like a Denny's. I'm with my triplet brother and sister. And we're sitting across the table from Mike Bickle. I was 20 years old. And, oh yeah, I'm not going to cry. I planned on not crying. I love Mike Bickle. Um, I really do. He's got his Bible open. Uh, to Proverbs 2. Stop, Dana. Okay. And, um, you know, his Bible is, it's just a maze of highlighters. It's just crazy. I don't know how he reads it, but then look at my notes. (laughs) How do I read it? Um, he says, there's a treasure to be found. It's called the knowledge of God. He says, it's costly. We will have to search as though we're searching for treasure. And we have to search as though everything else doesn't matter except finding that treasure. It's the beauty of Jesus. It's the beauty of Jesus. He says, it really will be costly. It really will take years. It'll take years. It'll take a long time. He says, but. It's the beauty of Jesus because he's really alive and he really, his word is true. And he began to unpack the apostolic prayers, Ephesians one, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Our eyes would be open to his beauty. Ephesians three, that we would know the height and width and length and depth of his love. He began to talk about John 17, that the very love with which the father loved the son would be in us. That's the treasure the treasure of knowing him, the treasure of seeing him, the treasure of being filled with his love. And I remember, I mean, first off, 
I was intimidated by Mike Bickle. I mean, I'll just admit that just the sheer charisma, you know, I'm like, wow, <laughs> but, but at the same time, I'm feeling this is what I want to give my life to the beauty of Jesus. It's real. It's costly, but it's not costly. Ask Paul, ask Mary of Bethany. Ask anyone that's actually tasted and seen and known that beauty. They will tell you it's gain. I count all else as rubbish. Mary of Bethany said, he's my future. Here's my dowry. He's my future. I'm going with him. So it's costly. In the sense of it'll cost time. It'll cost opportunities. You'll have to give up some things. It's worth it. So fast forward some few decades. And here I am and I'm feeling, God, what happened? I believed your word. And as far as I can tell, I don't know that I could stand with Paul and say, I know what you're talking about. Oh yeah, the fullness of the love of God. God, I felt the yearning. I cried out for it. I wanted what you said in your word with all my heart. God, what happened? And that's what can happen with delay. And we think delay equals he's saying no. And the Lord looks at us in those moments and he goes, again, I have not changed my mind. Don't you know that delay is part of preparation? Don't you know that when you find yourself in those times of chastening, don't you know that's me initiating the answer? I'm preparing you for that answer. Will you keep asking? Beloved, the Lord is inviting his church into partnership with his word. And he wants our hearts to actually believe him. He's going to do it. He's really going to do it. He's going to give the treasures of his heart, the riches of his beauty. He's going to open our eyes with a spirit of wisdom and revelation to see him. He's going to cause us to know that to know and comprehend that love. He's going to do it, but he wants us to believe him. So he's saying, will you still ask? Will you keep asking? And he wants us to stay in that aching and stay in that believing. The other obstacle I want to highlight is the lukewarm spirit from Revelation 3. We've been talking a lot about that in the last year. The Lord has highlighted it so much. There can be a lukewarmness that creeps into our first love and shuts it down. It's that feeling like, I'm okay. I'm actually fine. You know, that's what we find in Revelation 3, verse 15. I know your works that you're neither cold nor hot. So then because you are lukewarm, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you. Buy from me gold refined in the fire. One of the most vivid memories I have of this last year is after we were talking one night at one of our services about this passage. I remember I came off the platform. We were up here doing a panel. I came off the platform. And one of my dear friends, Tracy Slyker, we've been friends 20 years she came up to me, and I mean, you know, it's like in my face. <laughs> One of those conversations, <laughs> you know, I love her for it. She's this close to me, and her eyes are just broken, like her heart had been torn. Can you picture, like when someone's heart has been torn open, you know, obviously she's been crying, and she says to me, am I lukewarm? And I remember in that moment, I, I didn't even think about my response. Just out of my mouth, I say, probably. 
I think we all are. But that vivid memory I have, she opened her heart to the Holy Spirit because Jesus was knocking like a jealous bridegroom and she responded. And it's like Stuart was saying earlier today, there was a grace, there is a grace right now to let this conversation be personal. He's the only right evaluator. We are not good evaluators. We either think we're terrible or we think we're fine. (laughs) We're neither. (laughs) We're neither. And Jesus is going, you're not fine. You're not fine. I'm knocking. I'm pleading. I want to have a conversation, but I refuse Not having your voluntary love and your voluntary response. You have to open the door and let me in. And so this jealous bridegroom is inviting us into that conversation. Jesus, is there lukewarmness in my love for you, in my heart for you? Have I, for whatever all the reasons are, did I get tired of waiting? And I did I just get busy? Because I was tired of the place of prayer. I was tired of waiting on the Lord. Lord, can I just do anything but just sit before you? Can we admit that we got bored with Jesus? Can we admit that? Because there's a feast on the other side of that admission. There's a feast. There's a dining table. He's inviting us into it. He wants to take us from lukewarm to lovesick. He wants to lay us open. The times of disruption that we find ourselves in, the testing, the chastening. He's jealous. I heard Stuart, I heard Isaac say this too recently. Our Jesus is gangster. (laughs) He is not afraid of doing things outside the box. He will get our attention, whatever it takes. He really will. I mean, he's the same God who, you know, and Hosea hedged up Israel's way with thorns going, I'll hedge up your way. No problem. I'll put thorns all around you. And you know what? Then I'll speak comfort to your heart and then you're going to love me. That's Jesus. He, he breaks the rules. We have to be willing to understand that very possibly Some of our disruption is in fact him shaking us to get our hearts open to him because he wants it all and he's unrelenting. He's unrelenting. I kept thinking about a dream this week. It's funny, the phrase in the dream that I kept thinking of, it it was like a play on words, but it's this dream that Julie Julie Meyer had years ago. I mean, years and years ago, it was really in the early days of IHOP. She had this dream of this banqueting table. And the banqueting table was filled with fruit of all colors. It was beautiful. It's the most beautiful fruit you've ever seen. And Jesus is behind this table laughing and laughing and saying, eat, eat, friends, eat. And And in this dream, she began to see specific people, you know, and she, the the, the part that I kept thinking of this week was she saw Alan Hood, his face is stuffed with fruit. He can't talk because his cheeks are so full, but he still has that Southern accent and he's going, he's really serious, y'all. Eat. He's really serious, y'all. I kept thinking of that specific phrase in preparing for tonight this week. Because the seriousness, even the jealousy of Jesus is actually unto feasting. He's going, I'm getting you out of the obstacles. So you'll sit at the table and eat with me. Friends, I've got a feast. 
I want to get you to the lovesick bride at the end of the age that many waters cannot quench her love because she's so caught up in my beauty. She's so caught up in the feast. She's going, oh, I've tasted. I've seen. Are you kidding me? Take it all. Like John the Baptist said, let it decrease. I've heard the voice of the bridegroom. My joy's made full. Jesus is bringing his church to that lovesick place. But we have to taste. We have to sit down at that table. First, we have to open the door to the Jesus who's knocking. Then we sit down at that table and we begin to experience the the greatest pleasures available to the human heart. They're real. This is not poetry. This is real. Real satisfaction. Do we believe him? I think that's another way he's wanting to get into our hearts and he wants to get unbelief out. He's going, do do you not believe joy unspeakable and full of glory? Do you not believe me? Do you think I'm just talking poetically? Do you not believe at my right hand are pleasures forevermore? I put that in there for you. So you'd sit at the table. So you'd cast off the worldly loves. So you make space and make room and add fasting and sit down and feast because I am the one who's laughing behind that table saying, eat, oh friends, taste and see that I am good. Have the worship team come on up. Beloved, our future I love the future that we see in Song of Solomon. When the bride comes through the twofold test, she comes through the test of not feeling and experiencing the Lord's presence. The Lord's lifted his presence from her to test her love. He's really asking her the question, are you in it for me? Not only that, she's been beaten by the watchman. She's been struck by the good guys, she's hurt. She's gone, come through that test. And out of that test, she declares some of the most beautiful descriptions of Jesus in all of scripture. But first she says to the daughters, if you find my beloved, tell him I'm lovesick. If you find my beloved, tell him I'm lovesick. And then she begins to describe who her beloved is. My beloved Jesus. He's chief among 10,000. His leadership is perfect. It's like gold. His emotions. Who has emotions like him? The diversity of what he feels and his passion and his tenderness and his zeal. All the words of his mouth. The way that he looks at me with grace filling his eyes. Mercy. There's nobody like him. He's fully God. He's fully man. He took on flesh. That's our Jesus. That's what he's going to put in the heart. Our hearts, your heart, my heart. So that even when we come through difficult circumstances, we don't say, but God, that was so hard back there. Don't you see? I have a reason for this. Rather, we say, tell him I'm lovesick. Tell him I'm lovesick. The corporate body of Christ from every tongue and tribe at the end of the age will raise their hands together and say, tell him we're lovesick. And that's what he wants to put in our hearts. Revelation twenty two seventeen, And the spirit and the bride say, come. He's going to put in our hearts that Maranatha aching, the heart that says things are not okay till you return, Jesus. Jesus, the fullness that you have for my heart today, and then bring me into the fullness, the full glory, Jesus. Let's all stand together.